In this episode, we speak to Omar Chowdhury, who is the founder and CEO of FeedSource. FeedSource is a company that provides product photo shoots that are customized and turned around in minutes and made by expert photographers. Omar has worked in several ventures in the past as a serial entrepreneur. One has also included running his own fully fledged marketing agency. In this episode, we speak to Omar about not only his experience in running FeedSource, but also several family and personal struggles that he had when he was growing up. Today, FeedSource has become a huge reputable industry player and has been featured in New York Times, Vogue and GQ. Great to have you on our show today, Omar. Well, great to be here. Great to be here. Finally made it happen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I guess just to quick off, um, could you just let us know what your current role is, please, and uh, what FeedSource is all about? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm the founder and CEO of FeedSource. FeedSource is, uh, there, there's, there's a few elevator pitch ways of explaining it. The quickest way of explaining it is kind of the McDonald's drive through of product <laughs> photography or, pro or brand content. Um, so, so that speaks to kind of, you know, the idea of window one being um, selecting from our menu, which we call recipes, what type of visual style you'd like your brand to be represented in or your product to be represented in. And the window two is almost kind of building that out, customizing it and saying, you know what, um, I'd like my product to be shown in this way, maybe, you know, focus on the label from this angle or show the, the top of the bottle cap um, and you pay for it. And then on the third window, you pick up your photos. And that also, like I said, speaks to kind of the speed of it. We turn around photos and uh, 48 hours so you know that's you place your order product comes to us and you get a photo of 48 hours and it's you know very cost effective um speedy without compromising on the quality of the content so you get photos at that at that kind of speed and price point that can you know um have you sparring with with the heavyweights of brands in your sector so you kind of help brands showcase their products in the best possible light and fashion you know possible yeah, I mean, one of the main reasons uh, that we find it so exciting is because as the entry to market for brands has become lower, the barrier to entry has become lower, more and more people can set up their own businesses, more and more people can start online. And that's thanks to things like Shopify, of course, you know, uh, payment integrations like Stripe, uh, fulfillment networks as well, like Shopify have their own fulfillment networks now. So, you know, everything in the world, especially in e-commerce, has kind of just leveled up. Now with that also is the, the, the kind of content that brands put out and the appetite for content from consumers has also grown because of social media and you know, uh, what they're used to. So no longer are our customers looking at products from a lens of, oh, that's a mom and pop store. Um, the content's not that good, it's okay. You know? Or they don't see it like that. It's more like you know, content is content and attention is attention. And so if you've got brands like you know, uh, L'Oreal or, you know, Walkers or Pepsi, Coke, whatever, able to spend millions to, you know, really put behind content. Really, if you think, break it down, the actual visual asset is the main part, right? The visual asset is a bit that gets the attention. The placement, the reach, you know, the budgets behind it, that's a different game. But the actual visual asset itself is such a key component. But, you know, Throughout my, you know, uh, creative journey in my own kind of, you know, uh, profession, and working with creatives and, you know, being interested in production myself, figured that actually, if you break content down to almost atoms, it's actually made up of very, you know, few pieces of the puzzle, you know. And if you tighten them up and you kind of increase the efficiency level on each one of them, you can you can actually create content at that those levels without those type of budgets. And if we do that, and certainly at scale, well, now you can offer that to these mom and pop stores where they don't have to anymore shoot the content themselves because they can't afford to, or, um, or afford to go to a studio, or you know they, they, they don't have to spend hours speaking to product photographers to get content. And, and this, this day and age in the economy, man, you need content at all times. So we see ourselves as a kind of a vital part of that kind of e-commerce stack. And there's not really anyone filling the gap for the content space in the stack you know you've got the de facto for domain GoDaddy. you know you've got logos you've got you know um 99 designs and, and and canva for for presentation and um uh kind of graphic design you've got shopify of course for e-commerce but nothing really comes into that kind of space of content and we we, we believe we, we're going to fill that we, we are on a on a good trajectory trajectory to doing that that's awesome yeah it's quite interesting because like 
as a as a podcast we're always thinking about our content as well uh recently we've just uh started up video so you know we we can actually act actually allow our guests um or uh, visitors to actually see and watch us on youtube as opposed to just listen to us on a podcast and i think that's become increasingly important not just for podcasts but businesses yeah, brands man. constantly just having that visual aspect it allows you just to engage and we've discovered just by watching our videos back people can like actually engage in the conversation at a different level than just to right. use audio and listen through like spotify or uh, uh, apple or whatever it's so important man it's so imp it's so important and even even tools that you're using like if you think about you know, the platform we're using to record this podcast um even things like airpods or headphones um jeff bezos speaks of this you know or, or puts it together really well when he spoke of amazon and the time that he, he launched it and he said and he, and he relates it a bit to what he's doing with blue origin now in, in space and the idea is that when he launched amazon much of the heavy lifting had been done um for, for example you know the u.s postal office existed you know um, payment transaction experience existed. You know, you had banks and you could you could transact, uh, albeit a bit you know clunky at the time, but it still allowed you to do it. So then the internet came on, you know, and then that became another part of that. And so you know, if you add all those together, it became a perfect storm. Um, and which obviously you know gave birth to Amazon. And now he's kind of laying that foundation in his from his perspective in space, which is doing the heavy lifting of infrastructure in space, so that you know the future generations can come along and benefit from that so-called you know postal service or payment integration type of you know um scenario so i think i think it's great yeah you guys leveling up on utilizing more and more tools available to you might as well why not great the thanks for introducing yourself omar just want to go straight into learning a bit more about uh you know your background how it all started before you even launched food source you had like a you know you were raised uh, uh is it was it in london you were raised yeah west london yeah, we'd love to kind of learn where you were born, where you were raised, what was family life like uh, before we go into kind of your career. Sure. So I was uh, so, so I'm born into kind of a, a Pakistani background family. My my dad's uh, from Pakistan and I moved here when he was in his mid twenties. My mum was born and raised here. So kind of dynamics between them actually was quite interesting. You know, it was an arranged marriage. So um, you know, a lot of the the challenges you know in my parents life that we the kind of marriage that we saw as we were you know between, between the ages of zero to ten was their lack of understanding and communication and much of it you know neither, neither of theirs fault because you know my mom was 19 when she got married and you know her dad was quite strict as well and quite traditional um and so she didn't really get to discover and know herself you know i've just turned 30 and if i look back at just the 10 years of my 20s you know, and even what's going to come in my 30s, you know, there's a massive discovery phase in that, you know, self-discovery, um, self-awareness. And my mum, I don't think, was able to develop those tools. I wouldn't even knew that they existed. And then comes my father, who himself did it. He's, he's one of 12 siblings, grown up in a village in Pakistan. You know, his dad was a farmer, very traditional again. Um, so they both lack kind of that, that, that kind of father figure, empathy, emotional development side of things. And so they didn't really know how to emotionally connect to each other. And, you know, um, my, my dad certainly didn't. And that had an impact. And, and, you know, all the cracks that appeared in that kind of, you know, 15 year period they were married um, were, were down to communication, ultimately. And so as we were growing up, you know, I'm, I'm, one sib I'm the second of uh, four siblings. or well, five now. My dad's um, remarried and uh, he's um, got, we got, we got a beautiful uh, stepsister. And... Um, but in that house, man, it was it was it was a lot of trying to make sense of the dynamics between our parents, you know, um, and just seeing, seeing things like arguments and, you know, it wasn't like it was all the time, but where we'd see them, it would be confusing, you know, and our siblings became quite close in that. And we still are because we, ha we only had each other. So um, at the time, my dad, my dad's always been a businessman. So he had like a, a, a record store Then he, he went into uh, the music business a bit. Then he went into um, running his own, a very successful, in fact, uh, ticket ticketing business. And he was competing, he's like very competing very closely with like C tickets and Ticketmaster and companies like that. So he was doing that. My mum was, you know, kind of a stay at home mum raised us. Um, and then she went to, um, once my parents uh, got divorced, um, she, she went into university and, and became a, a teacher. So she does that now. So we were very young when my parents divorced. I think I was about nine or 10. Um, but that was kind of a massive inflection point, you know, because, you know, your father is, 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 you know, you see him as this tall figure in the house, this kind of superhero. 
And once that's kind of removed from your setting on a day-to-day level, it's very hard for you to make sense of it. And in fact, it's only in the last year or 18 months that I've even understood what effect that had on me, you know, and right. what from that has been a positive in my life and what, what from that has, you know, maybe been challenging. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was quite challenging in that sense. And, and from there, it became quite hard. You know, my mom was a single parent. Um, you know, we, we raised council home. So, you know, we had to, you know, really try to figure things out. And the divorce wasn't the easiest. So there was times where we, you know, were living in, um, not in any kind of regular accommodation. We had to go live with like shared family uh, housing. So we were living with like, other families because my mom didn't feel safe enough to like live in her house with us. So the dynamics were just like very, very hard for us to understand. And we were still, you know, probably about 10 years old, 11 years old at that time. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was very interesting, but a lot of it was just kind of witnessing these interesting dynamics between these two people who you love so much and are everything to you, and then you know this superhero is almost removed from your life, and it seems more like to you at the time that oh you don't want to raise me, you know, and that's not the case. As you got to understand, then then you feel sorry for your mum, and you know my mum has had so many of her own challenges. I will speak about later if you want, and um, seeing that was just almost having like a front row seat at your kind of your your mum's kind of soft destruction to an extent and it sounds quite extreme that phrase but it's true you know the, the extent to which you you know her health took her felt like that and i've been the eldest son and just seeing this and you're and and it's it's hard because you feel helpless you know there, there, there's very little you can do in fact and nothing you can do and i think from that came this drive the ambition the willpower whatever it is for me to you know try and navigate the next you know 20 years of of my life yeah sure Uh, i guess moving on to your early career then omar um you launched your first business when you were 17 years old which is which is pretty impressive in itself um what was that first business and perhaps what are the lessons you you kind of took away from that well but actually i was doing kind of business businessy things even in school even younger than that so i think when i was in high school i noticed that everyone would uh kind of um, love playing pro evo and you know or like football manager was a massive game right there at that point you know, people just play on the computer and they'd come on discs and i figured out how to basically bootleg them so i figured out how to get like kind of the raw game file i don't think you could do it anymore and then um get like i'm just a stack of discs from pc world and then excuse me, then i figured out how to add like a second kind of copying like disk unit into the computer and then kind of I'd like copy the disk and I'd make loads of copies of those <coughs> so the direct copy but then I'd get like discs that had a white surface and I bought like a printer as well right. so I got the artwork of Football Manager and I literally printed the artwork onto the disk as well trying to make it as real as possible yeah. <laughs> I like printed the actual actual sleeves got like um, the, the, the plastic casing I can't remember where I got it from that like empty plastic casing and then I put like the sleeves in there and the, the, and the printed disk and I go to school, my school, we had a coach that went to school, so it was like a half an hour coach that took us to right. school. And I go on there and I just like send it to the boys and say, hey guys, I, I sell Pro Evo. <laughs> and then no one wanted to pay. At the time, I think it was like 35, 40 quid, you have to ask your parents. And it sounds like a million pounds yeah. to your child. And, and then you know, I would sell it for a fiver. So I was like, guys, you just buy it off me. Why do you want to ask your parents? So that was pretty cool. And, and, um, and obviously, you know, five pounds was, you know, so much. So I would just, I would just sell these. So that was kind of like, small entrepreneurial things that I would do in school. Yeah. Um, and then when I was 17, yeah, that was, that was kind of the time when I was just finishing my, um, my A-levels and uh, I got really good grades. I got all A to C's, got into Russell Group Universities and I was very, you know, happy with what I'd achieved academically. And, but, 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 I, but my perspective at that time had developed more on like how I'd see the, seen the world. And I think certainly from early on in my life, things like with my father, I, I really, you know, had a lot of time to to ponder things myself. And I'm, I'm heavily curious. So, you know, I'm always questioning why and, you know, digging deep and searching for knowledge and, you know, just finding curiosities in loads of different areas. Uh, sorry, following curiosities in different areas. And doing that kind of made me question things like authority. You know, I was like, well, just because why, why do you have to do things because you're just told to do them you know like going to university or like what why why are we just told to do that why why is a nine to five forty nine to five what's the significance of 9 a.m or 5 p.m like who said that that's the thing why do we have week why do we have weekends you know why can't every day be a weekend things like that you know and, and then that would kind of make me feel free because as i'd question it and i'd realize that some of these things are just like kind of 
man-made concepts really for convenience so everyone kind of easily filter down one mechanism and you know it makes it it just makes it more convenient for people to just go through life if you're just kind of told that like you just are like kind of in this factory and you just start here and you end there and along the way you pay taxes and have kids and you know all that type of stuff well, that's, that sounds crazy to me so um it was probably a bit over overly like kind of simplistic thinking but and then that matched with this idea of kind of a lack of authority lack of respect for authority where i felt like you know you, my, my old dad kind of wasn't around as much as maybe when I needed him or wanted him to be around, um, affected me in a way that I was like, well, that's that's the person whose child I am, you know? And so if I don't feel that connection or sense of nurturing there, then then who else in this world is gonna give that to me? You know, so I started taking it upon myself to figure out like, okay, I guess I'm just gonna have to look out for myself. So by the time I left uh, college, it didn't make any sense to me to just go into further education. I didn't just wanna go into that system. So I just started, um, at that time I was heavily creative. So I'd been to film school um, during my summer holidays. I'd like done various kind of creative endeavors, just like I created like a, um, a clothing brand in college. Um, so I started to understand a bit more about creativity and marketing. And the natural kind of step from there was, was starting a marketing agency. But that wasn't, that wasn't like a, a conscious thought. It was just an opportunity where somebody had seen our work uh, this kind of guy who ran other businesses and say, hey, I love what you guys do. You're very creative. You know, you're young. I've got the contacts. You know, I know that you knew loads of people in kind of the music industry, entertainment industry. And he said, why don't I bring you the clients? You guys, you guys meeting me, myself, my brother. Why don't you guys uh, bring the creativity? And uh, we just service them and we create this kind of agency. So th that's that's where that was born from. Is that flavor? No, that was that was called six two. Okay. So six two actually it, it, the reason it's called six two is because on a phone keypad the numbers six and two are my initials O and C. Right. Oh. So well, that's when it was, it was silly. Yeah, it was just very random. So it came from that. So six two it was six two media and that became the company. We 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 had that for maybe four years. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I mentioned flavor is because we talked about that in the previous conversation. And so at which point was six two formed, and then when did feed uh, when did flavor uh former how do we get to that uh that firm because that was a completely different business that you set up later on it sounds like yeah yeah i mean each of these businesses like if you take six to you take flavor you take feed source they actually are quite telling of my age and kind of what i was going through at the time and they're, they're also so transformative um uh, having such trans transformative points in my life like massive inflection points you know very uh poignant things happened at that time like if you take six two for example you know, I've just come out of college, you know, trying to understand how the world works, how money works, um, trying to find my space in kind of a working world. Um, and and that was a large part of that. And also dealing with the whole fact that my friends had all gone to university and I'm working, you know, so dealing with the emotional sides of that. And then if you look at flavor, which we can speak about in a minute, um, it was, was a lot to do with me now getting married, you know, starting to have my children and then dealing with how to balance work and life and what that looks like and you know how i feel about it and then feed source has been a bit more of a mature sense now which is a bit more i feel like the first conscious business i'm operating you know as opposed to the others being more like just something i i, I feel like I, I wanted to do kind of just to make money or to you know like um, i knew how to do that time yeah 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 yeah. but i never really spoke to my core do you want to talk a little bit about how, how you were kind of coping with, with with things things like that that were going on yeah man i know some of these things i haven't really spoken about much because i haven't even been able to make sense of them until till recently really i've actually recently now got a life coach i spent a lot of time with him and just in terms of untangling you know various aspects of my upbringing or you know what i've experienced and trying to try to make sense of them so that kind of time at that point i suppose the most confusing part of it was my heart and uh, you know who i am in, inside and the way i'm raised you know i have the best of intentions and, I'm, and I, I mean well you know i don't wish bad upon anyone i don't want to do bad to anyone like i i just want let everyone to be happy you know and that's why i'm I, as a creative that's what you want to do you just want to create right. better things um and you get joy out of joy out of that like I, I love creating experiences for other people to interact with so when I was, so that's kind of my soul and that's where I come from. But then the, the things I was going through were bringing outside to me that didn't feel, feel like it aligned to that, you know, that, that the, my business partner and the, the type of people we do business with, it was like his, his whole mindset was 
well, you haven't had a dad around much, so I'm going to kind of be this big brother and I'm going to show you what life's about type of attitude, you know, but really put me in scenarios that were, that were super uncomfortable. But that's kind of what's, that, what's what brought out, like I said, that street education, you know, like doing business with people that might be gangsters, you know what I mean? That like, you don't want to be doing business with these people, you know, and these people are paying me to do a project for them, him knowing I've got 15 projects going on anyway, which by the way, is bananas for a 19 year old to take on at, at once. Um, I mean, the stress levels to the point that I was like, passing out wow. and like i would i would i'd be walking i'd be walking imagine i'd be walking and my, my brain would go and i'd drop to the floor like something out That's of crazy. like like if someone's pressed a button or something yeah i mean and and, and it was terrible and he'd see this so you'd you know faint. And, and it just just dropped man i've dropped near a river before like all sorts oh, and, and and it, it was like and it was it was like yeah let's let's, let's keep going you know not recognize not recognize that that level of kind of just bluntness that's like yeah let's keep going you'll keep working you know what i mean we get through this i'll sleep on the office floor like making me clean his fish tank like god forbid i didn't like know what i don't know like a specific terminology of like a, a web server meant like slam his hand on the table my computer would break and i'd have to fix it you know what i mean like torture like in this day and age you go to prison for that you know like but, but i didn't know how to talk about it i didn't know who to share that with nothing no one knew no one like and it was just things I'd go through, and I was scared as well, you know. And now that I've grown up, I've realised that actually someone like that is an absolute coward. You know, you're a wimp. So if I, you know, if I was to interact with someone like that now, like I'd, I'd, I'd know what to say to them. I know how to handle it. By that time, you know, in, inside of me, I didn't know because I was like, you're the, you're the, you're the first real outside male human I've interacted with on this level. So I don't even know is this what people in the real world are like? This I'm um, eighteen, nineteen. You know what I mean? Is this this might be maybe this is normal. So I'm just like, okay, I guess I'm trying to be successful. I've got to do this. At the time, he'd like convinced me as well, like just before that to like buy a Porsche, like, you know, be really, you know, kind of like you need to look, this is kind of his whole thing. It's like, you need to look the part, whatever. I was like, man, I don't have money to put petrol in a Porsche, <laughs> let alone have a Porsche. But, you know, he conv convinced me to like, convince me to convince my uncle to like wow. finance the Porsche for me, which is stupid. Imagine the levels of manipulation this guy did. And, um, and and the, the, I, I couldn't drive it. Doctor said, you can't drive. You know, you certainly can't drive a car like that right now. So he would drive my car. So on top of that, you're not driving my car, you know? And I was so just done with everything. I like text him saying, don't talk to me. I don't know where I'm going. Just, just, just don't contact me. And I must've gotten like a bus and a train and ended up near Heathrow airport. And I went all the wrong direction because my brain wasn't even functioning just to get back home. And I gave him my brother, my house key the day before because he'd come home from uni. And my brother had texted him saying, I can't get through to Omar, where he is, is he? He said, I don't know, I think he's in the office or something. No, full and well, I wasn't in the office. You know, he knew. But um, when the story progresses, you understand why it's so frustrating for my brother. And um, I basically went home and I didn't have a key to get in. So we live opposite a primary school. As I imagine, I'm opposite like a school and I'm trying to break into my own house. And I figured out, you know, going to the top flat, like climbed into the, like, the top window and got in and basically wrote a suicide note. And... Um, start planning like just to kill myself i was like no i can't do this this is just terrible you know like first of all how do i explain this to anyone whatever and uh, it was just the most heartbreaking experience and i remember i remember everything and that's why my brother ultimately was so sad because he was like you knew that he wasn't like feeling right and you'd lied to me imagine something happened to him you know um and, and it, got, it got to a point man where i was like like just literally just just, just ready to just like take my life man and actually the heartbreaking thing is my younger sister at that time maybe was 13 or 14. She, probably 13, she coming home from high school just at that time. And she walked in and she sees me literally in the hallway, like planning to take my life. You know what I mean? Just watching the whole thing. Like she saw everything. Like, um, man, and, and uh, yeah, it was bananas, man. Like she, she, she obviously started crying, you know, just, just said, what are you doing? And then like, you know, just grab me and just like move me out of the way and um, call my mom. Like every like everyone just turned on my mom came home. My mom literally just started hitting me. She was like, like, what the f are you doing? Like, uh, how dare you? Like, she didn't understand. You know, she's like, I have obviously a mom, man. She's coming from like just from school. Like, what's going on? I'm just sitting instead and I'm just like bawling, crying. I can't even get words out. My brother came on, my brother started punching up like the bed, you know, cause he was angry. He was like, why did he lie to me? Like, imagine something happened. Like, I knew this was going on. Like everyone, he had a feeling, but he didn't know. 
And mum was like, what is it? And when I said the two, I basically this guy's name, I was like crying so much, I just might say this guy's name. And mum goes, is it him? Is he doing this to you? Like, what's he putting your head? And my mum just lost it, like called him, effing and blinding. And like, just, just everyone was just livid. They're like, we trusted you with him. You know what I mean? And I ended up in hospital. My dad was disappointed. Obviously everyone was disappointed in me to an extent, which I understand. But more so, you know, they, they were so nice, kind of the support they gave me after, like everyone was there and I rallied around and, you know, um, came to, you know, my uncle who lives in, my mom's brother who lives in Saudi Arabia, he flew in and, you know, just came and just like spent time with me. And we're like, look, you right now, you just need support. Um, and the doctor tried to put me on medication at the time, but I was like, you know, I don't want to fall into that trap. Um, but it was just, it was just a very, very dark and like lonely, gruesome place. But it, I just didn't know how to escape like that kind of mental torture. You know, and I was only 21. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, that was just like gruesome, man. Yeah, that time. Yeah. That sounds like, a, you know, obviously a very difficult time in your life, Omar, man. And uh, I can appreciate that. It must have been really difficult to share with us. So, so thanks so much. For yeah, no, no, I really no, appreciate no, it's, that. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, you kind of uh, managed to kind of get out of that situation, which I guess uh, led you to, to finding flavour later, later yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, right? that, that came out. So I, I started going to Google Campus and I, and I think initiatives like that are so important, man. And, and I think one part of like why even the things I do now and, you know, some of the guys that we have here, you know, who are young interns who start here and end up like, you know, becoming full-time creatives um, and people in various positions in our company, it's because I remember at that time, like if Google Campus hadn't existed and that wasn't a free initiative, like it, I, I wouldn't know what to do, you know? And I, there was this thing that in, in Shoreditch you could go to and I would go there and there were other creatives there. And there was a job board where you could find like projects that people wanted help with. And one of them was like this finance app that some of these guys wanted to build. So I just contacted them and I just, you know, on the way there just decided a price that I wanted to charge. And the price was kind of just determined by the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, the, the doctors had said that your mum's not getting much better at the moment and sadly her, her the chemo had affected her mental health to the point that she had to be sectioned so she was now in a mental hospital um and couldn't come home until she was fit enough to come home but they said to us that even when she does come home you're gonna have to change the environment because that's the same house that she got married in divorced in well um you know experienced like so many highs and lows that try and change the environment for her. if you can't move house then like change like just do it up so that so I charged like I think it was eight grand to these guys and I was like that that would give me enough money to just renovate the house a bit. So that's what we did and um that's how I learned how to get projects and from that year I just set myself a goal. I was like, okay, screw it, this year I wanna make a hundred grand. And then I just, you know, did whatever it took, worked any hours, you know, to make sure I made that money being a designer. Um and then year on year, I did that for about a couple of years and like the freelancing stuff grew. But to a point where Flavor then came in, I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Like, I'm one person. What if I actually built kind of an agency around this and use my sales techniques, but had other people that could take on work? And then maybe I could make more money. So that's kind of how, how, how Flavor was born. But yeah, that's, that's, that's really the story to, to get there. <laughs> so Omar, uh, thanks for sharing that Flavor, um, you know, agency business setup. Sounds like it started to, to scale. Um, I would like to kind of move on to feed source. And, yeah, yeah. you know, what was the turning point that got you to feed source? And then can you start sort of introducing what was the aha moment where you thought, actually, you know what, feed source is, is, is it? That's where this needs to go. And this is what we need to make now. Sure. So when we were running Flavor, we had the luxury of working with some amazing clients, um, uh, people like Hilton. We had a deal with Deliveroo at the time when they were pretty early on. Um, and we were working with these brands. And what we were noticing more and more is that, we offered kind of these retainers and packages for kind of marketing solutions, like all your social media marketing, whatever, and content. But they just wanted more and more content. So almost to a point where they were like, look, take out everything else and just give us more content. And we were like, okay, cool. That's interesting inside. We'll just do more of that. But we just kind of charged them accordingly. But then what happened is because we had more and more clients like that and more and more content requests, the guys in the studio, um, at that time I had my first daughter as well, so I was kind of not really present at the office as much. And these guys had to get the work done. They kind of makeshifted like a photography setup where they would like stick like a colored paper to the walls and, you know, uh, just make all these different small setups so they could just shoot quickly. And um, when I came in, I was like, this is crazy. It's pretty interesting. Like it's kind of cool that we can create content this quick. What if we added some props to this? You know, what would that look like? And then that's kind of where, the, where, where this kind of idea started ticking in my head. Um, of this idea of, you know, what if 
we didn't do the agency stuff and instead just took this element of like product photography and turned it into a kind of a platform. And I was really getting obsessed with platform experience like Uber, Airbnb, this idea that you could take complex problems that people would say, no, nobody's ever going to do that. You know, like going to a stranger's car or like staying in a stranger's house, like the most complex and the most ludicrous ideas. But through like genius design, genius communication, genius branding, genius platform experience, you're able to create a safe haven for the consumer, you know, and then it turns into a marketplace where you've got two sides of it. You know, if someone told the founders of Airbnb, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that there'll be high rises being built around the world just for the sole purpose of customers staying there from your website, you'd be like, what? I can't even get one person to like even agree to this idea right now, invest in it, you know? <laughs> so you have to be that ambitious. So right. we kind of feel like at times we're there, like they're, they're with Fetals now, which is, you know, to get people onto that, onto that kind of mindset with, with content. But when I'd see those things and I watched then another interesting thing was I watched the founder movie at the time, the, the McDonald's, uh, the McDonald's story. And there's this amazing scene in there where they're kind of drawing out that first McDonald's kitchen or like a, uh, kind of on like a tennis court and with chalk, they're drawing out like, here's where the, the, the fryer will go. Here's where the, the, the devastation will go, you know, and they're kind of choreographing this. And it's like a beautiful kind of, I think they called it a symphony of efficiency. And I love that term. I was like, that's so cool. So I was like, okay, imagine there's like a symphony of efficiency like this, but for content, like almost like the studio, and just like kind of like a, like a dancing act, you know, like how beautiful would that be? Um, and that's kind of like, was like, ah, oh, the aha moment. It was like, yeah, we need to create something that's just tailored towards product photography that focuses on high quality content, speed, price effectiveness, but like five-star customer experience. So uh, that, that's where I was born from. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, and how do you, or how does Feed Source go about kind of acquiring its its clients at Omar? What's uh, you know what kind of strategies do you do you employ there? So to start with, I've I've, had, I've been able to develop a little bit of a social presence myself, so that helped in the beginning, but just to get a bit of awareness out. Um, and so a lot of the early kind of customers or people that would see my stuff on social media, I would just kind of you know follow the brand and start interacting with it. So started off like that, and we'd be very lucky to have ex excellent word of mouth. So, you know, the, the business has grown very organically. Um, and up until very recently, we'd spent like zero dollars on marketing, like nothing on ad spend, um, to the point that we had we had Facebook offer us partnerships. We're developing a relationship with like, I'm, I'm, I'm in contact with the president of Shopify now. I like, you know, just these like, just organic relationships that we developed over the course of the business, just by people kind of hearing about us and seeing what we're doing and seeing the innovative approach to it. Um, so I think there was that trust pilot, you know, we got 4.8 out of five stars now. So, you know, we're, we're very highly recommended, you know, people love the experience of what we do for them. So that has a massive effect. And also the e-commerce community is like that. People share their experiences, you know, you're dealing with um, kind of individuals who are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're mature people, you know, they bring the product to market, there's a certain kind of characteristic that comes with that, you know, you're not dealing with just like kind of a, a hater, you know. You're dealing with someone that wants to share, they want to encourage people, they want to empower, right. and that breeds, you know, more business. So that happens. But very recently, actually, we started, we started now actually building in initiatives to, as we, the business is scaling. So we're introducing a free trial model. Actually, the deadline for the, for the product team to deliver that to me is today. So I'm, I'm, I'll be getting that today. <laughs> so um, we, we, right. we are pressing on them for that. And then uh, we just uh, did an outreach program with brands that are li listed as Selfridges. And the hunch for that was that when people are listed as Selfridges, normally they enter there because they want that, that kind of first clout. You know, they want to they wanna just say that they've been in Selfridges. Same way a brand will say, we've been seen in Vogue, you know. Um, but often those brands don't have great content. You know, they list their Selfridges, but they, their social media isn't really well maintained. So we pick out all these brands and we hit them up and say, hey, you know, we'd love to create some content for you. And in fact, in most cases, we'd buy the product first shoot the content and send it to them and say, wow. saw your product at Selfridges, wow. love the product, we bought the product and we shot the content. Here's the content, you can keep it for free, use it, don't have to even credit us. If you, you know, let us know how it works for you, if you want anything else, let us know. And I would personally, and I still have this active program we're doing, and I'm personally emailing these people and I've built amazing relationships with like the CEOs of some company that I never think I'd be able to connect with before. But by way of literally, we have a whole, station here and a, and a team that just work on outreach program now so the products come in they just shoot them within minutes they go out from my email 
to the brand owners and then like with relationships like that. So it's a bit of a longer play, but, it's, but it shows that it, in terms of getting business customers on board when you're a B2B business, you've really got to nurture relationships, you know, because the, there's, a, there's a massive long game in that, you know, our, our lifetime value of customers is very high. Once people come to us and experience what Fetos does, there's no reason for them to go elsewhere. One, because there's not really anything else that does that. And B, you know, we understand their brand now and they love our experience. So they, whenever they need content, they just keep coming back. So the next step now for us will be, how do we create a retention model around that? You no, know, where do we start understanding? Is there a subscription model in there somewhere? Is there, you know, how, do we, how do we turn these customers into kind of really, you know, a, a long-term like sustainable um, structure for the business as opposed to having to constantly get, go out and get new business? That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds really fascinating. I think photo photography is a really, you know, really important topic. I think especially through e-commerce, just blowing up obviously in the last couple of years and then just trying to connect, you know, consumers to products through through photography is absolutely critical, I think. Um, I just wanted to kind of hone in specifically on, um, yeah, fundraising. You told us a really interesting story that you met somebody through Instagram and you uh, were able to, you know, find... Uh, funding just through Instagram. That's really cool. And I think some people who might be listening who have businesses might be inspired by that story as well. Yeah, I, I've been very lucky. I'm very lucky just be, just because, you know, I've had a bit of an audience that I have been able to share the feed source story and the journey. And that's, you know, been, been so, you know, helpful to uh, to other founders as well, because, you know, I, I'm I'm more than willing to share the ups and the downs, you know, and certainly the struggles resonate with people. And I think through that, if you think about, um, you know, especially you, Sunny, you know, when you're meeting with founders, that often you're back in the, the jockey, not the horse, you know, you're like, why will that person make this work? Um, and right. with feed source, a lot of it's that, like, I know why I'm going to take this to where it's going to go to, you know, with an incredible team and incredible vision, we'll get there. But the investors looking to see what, what I'm going to do now, you know, in terms of t- returning that investment for them. So when we started raising funding, I just started talking about it online and I shared the journey of like what we've done with Feed So I kind of made like a pitch deck on store on the Instagram stories. Um, and then I just said, hey, we're raising, you know, like 150 grand or whatever it was at like a three million pound valuation. You know, if anyone wants in here, like swipe up here and there's like a type form or just DM me. And then, you know, I actually got loads of DMs and loads of interest, which is so, in- so interesting. And, and, and some of those uh, uh, people we're still nurturing relationships with but one of them was this lady who runs um like a medical business i think she supplies she, she provides supplies to like hospitals and she's a young entrepreneur i think she's 26 and quite successful and she just hit me up and said look oh my i followed you followed your wife i love the story i love what's going on i have to be involved you know how much you're going to raise and then i said to her why don't we just chat on the phone and this was like 11 p.m at night you know, kids are all in bed and I'm sitting there like trying to raise money. I'm like, we've got to, we've got to figure this out because by, this, by the way, like feed source at this point, two and a half, three years in is self-funded, you know, and I've got three kids. So, you know, I'm like trying to look after my family and fund the business sure. and it needs to grow. And uh, we got the phone and, and it was like the quickest conversation. I was like, you know, we're raising this much and whatever. She's like, okay, how would it work? Like I haven't invested before. Like, how does the payment structure work? Like, okay, well, our legal team will do this. This is how we engage and in the term sheet. And, um, she said, all right, cool. And, and even um, she said, yeah, I'll, I'll invest. I was like, you sure? Do you want to meet me? Wow. Or She goes, yeah, yeah, we can, we, we can meet, I guess. I was like, all right, do you want me to show you our plan? She goes, yeah, yeah, you can show me. I was like, all right, good. And, uh, and I have wow. one friend who's a VC. And I called him. I said, does this make any sense? And he goes, how did you get a three million pound valuation? He goes, what's your revenue? He goes, you shouldn't be getting a three million pound valuation. What's going on? Uh, but he goes, but, but then when I explained it to him, he was like, oh, can that make sense? All right, yeah, I get it. And he's like, yeah, cool. Like, you know, take the deal. And then we 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 we, we did a deal with her, um, and then she actually ended up uh, investing investing more. Uh, she she topped up the investment another hundred grand um, through that year, and um, you know she's been an amazing investor, just like silent investor, very supportive, you know, um, and has, has collaborated with us really well. And so now we're now we're looking to raise our next round because that was maybe a year and a half ago, but we've managed to execute what we wanted to in that this kind of eighteen month period which is really to get the business to a point where we're able to solidify our team, um, understand our consumer. You know, the focus wasn't on revenue. The focus wasn't on, you know, trying to, because we know this this business really grows at scale. It was really important to get the infrastructure right. So now we're in a position where we can introduce multiple forms of content. So videos are coming now. 
uh, which businesses need, especially with algorithms on TikTok and, you know, Instagram reels. So videos are coming now, you know, we're extending more of our, you know, uh, reach in, in terms of customers. And we want to get a bit more uh, global access to to creators as well now. So we're building a supply chain. So we're in a position now where we're ready to take the next stage, but that's where we now need to raise the next set of funding to take us there. Um, so I'm right now focused on that. Like I'm kind of in that fundraising phase right now, just trying to connect with investors and trying to, you know, sell the idea of what we're building for the, for the future. That's that's such a great story. Very like out of the box thinking though, Imran. I really, really <laughs> love that. Absolutely love cool, that. It was cool, man. It took to, um, it took me by surprise as well. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely amazing. That's awesome. All right. Well, no, thank you for sharing that whole journey. Um, want to start wrapping this conversation up a bit. What's the future hold for Feed Source for you? Um, and then we've got one more question that we always ask our guests. So uh, yeah, sure. before we get into that, what's the future hold? So Feed Source, the, the vision behind Feed Source is is huge. You know, we um, we want to provide our mission is to help brands showcase their products. So you know, we really want to create a platform experience where it's fully immersive. Brands can literally log on. Imagine using like a Canva type experience or like a you know a, we call it Shoot Builder. We can go on there and you can literally add your products connect with Shopify, you know, have all your product inventory there, build out your shoot, you know, customize everything you want in the shoot, um, connect with the photographer, connect with photographers around the world, instantly chat live with them as they're working your shoots um, and kind of have a very, very like immersive experience in terms of building your content, but remotely. And then we want to kind of build uh, these, this idea of feed source hubs, which here is the first hub. Uh, I'm a trial in kind of the interface here, which is um, effective, effectively think of like Amazon fulfillment centers, but, but, for production right. right so maybe not as large maybe not as large um but loads of localized hubs in different areas because there's so many amazing creators and photographers out there and a massive part of the business for us is the creative economy you know there's the, some of the greatest talents out there right now are creatives photographers and they are the hidden gems um that brands need but the issue is they don't have an easy route to market you know they've got to go down traditional ways of creating their portfolio getting attention finding business and some of the best creatives actually are, are introverts, you know, in some cases, and they, they don't know, have business acumen and they shouldn't need to, you know, they, 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 their artistry is the beauty. And that's all that brands want too. So if we can be the facilitator in the, mid, facilitator in the middle, the aggregator, the marketplace that says, look, brands, here's how you build your shoot. This is all you need to worry about. Creators, here's all the infrastructure you need. Here are the hubs. You tap in 24 seven, you go in, prop inventory is there you've got support there you've got other creators there you just pick orders like you're getting them like orders coming in like they're in like a i don't know literally like a fast food restaurant like orders coming in you put mm -hmm. the order order goes out you know like that and you're just focusing on being a creative and with our model and the the economies of scale you can earn four times more than a, the average salary of a photographer in london you know so you know the, the economic benefits are, are enormous for photographers and can work in their own timing so we're really unlocking a whole new creator economy here and that's part of the reason that i think shopify have shown interest facebook have shown interest and so you know my kind of strategic approach to that is just maintaining those relationships and just kind of sus sussing where the best time is for us to partner up and interact um but certainly for me i believe feed source will get to a point where um if, if it's if it's if it if it's not a you know sizable acquisition by by one of those big companies we end up um, going public just you know by, by way of building this into you know a very large creator economy well very big plans very big plans excited yeah. for the future Thank um you. i i just to finish off our conversation then Uma, i just would like to ask you if you could uh, invite three guests for jai living or otherwise who would they be and why Oh, that's a very good question. Okay, for your podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, for Chai, like to, uh, to, to just have tea. For Chai, for Chai, yeah, yeah. Oh, so just, just so you can have, just yeah, just so you can have tea with anyone. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Damn. All right. These are who I find the most interesting. I think Jeff Bezos would be one. Who? Cool. Because I love. Uh, oh yeah, let's go. Jeff Bezos, Bob Iger. So Jeff Bezos, because I love the way. He thinks about complex operations and simplifies them down into common sense thinking. And I love that. I love that framework of thinking. Just, you know, things just, and most of the, the most amazing things in the world are common sense thinking. And in fact, we complicate them as humans, you know? So um, that's, that's what, what I really love about the way he thinks. Um, mm -hmm. Bob Iger, who was the CEO of Disney for kind of 15 years. And I love 
his operational management and his conduct as a CEO, you know, there's, there's a finesse to it. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 some base to his character, you know, that really comes right. across, you know, that is a level of confidence and, and, and clarity, which I think is interesting. Those two. And the third, ooh. you know what? I would love to actually sit with Johnny Ive. Um, who's the designer of Apple products. Um, just from a design perspective, I think it'd be so fascinating to talk about the cadence of things. I'm obsessed with that. Like, if, if, for example, if someone comes to my literally for chai, this relates to chai, if someone comes to my house for, you know, to sit with me, if I'm making them coffee, we have different like, mugs in our house, but there's like these mugs that have like this, a specific type of lip that kind of just like comes out a little bit. Um, which I think is so much more comfortable to drink through. And we have the other mugs, which are a bit more rounded than it, which I don't think are as comfortable, but I think it just makes the drinking experience better when you're having coffee or tea. So just things like that cadence, like uh, uh, they're the, the small details that it designed that even to me are so much so important in terms of the experience. So I'd love sure. to speak to someone like that about the, the fine details of things. Cause I think, you know, design is just, just, just everything. We love your passion, man. We just watch you like <laughs> just inspired by your passion. Oh, Omar, man. Thank you for having me. It, it's on, honestly been a real pleasure um, having you on the show. Uh, where can people get in touch and find your uh, your your content? Sure, man. Um, so uh, feedsource.com is the, the company. So it's uh, F E E D S A U C E. We've had people think it's like feed source or feed source, <laughs> like a S O U R C. It's funny. So yeah, feedsource.com is basically it's like literally source for your feed. Um, so that's that's it. So feedsource.com, uh, and then I, you can find me on Instagram, Instagram, and my handle is Omar Chowdhury. So O M A R C H O U D H R Y. Uh, so that's it, man. Yeah, just, just come say hello. Thank you for having me, guys. Like, honestly, I'm I'm so I'm so proud of you guys for even doing this. And you know, for those guys who don't know, like Sunny is probably you know met me when i was maybe like 15 or 16 in college because we have mutual friends you know and it was so nice to you know connect with you and you know now to you know meet you as well Andy. and i think you guys do something amazing you know even by the way when you conduct conduct this podcast and when you guys work together i think it's excellent even the professionalism in how you set it up you know and make the guests feel comfortable you do a great job man so i, I definitely encourage more and more people to engage with you and i'm going to just definitely listen to more pod, uh, more episodes of your guys as well Great. Thank you so much for the kind words, Omar. We really appreciate that feedback. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and to hear your story. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and Feedstalls grow in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Speak to you guys soon. Yeah, cheers.